everyone, this is Tyler Dallas from the FW de Klerk Foundation, and you're listening to the Constitution at Work podcast, the series for people interested in constitutional matters and transformation in South Africa. Today, I'm joined by Dave Stewart, chairperson of the FW de Klerk Foundation, Ismail Yusuf, our legal officer, and Liam Erasmus, our newest intern. Thank you, each of you, for joining me to discuss the findings of our 2023 Cultural, Religious, and Language Rights Report Card which will be released this Friday in honor of Heritage Day. <laughs> Positive intercommunity relations play a critical role in ensuring peace, stability, and the long-term success of South Africa. Because of this, we have revived this important annual report card. The purpose of this study in the form of a scorecard will be to assess the degree to which we are succeeding in assuring and promoting the rights of our cultural, religious and linguistic communities in accordance with the relevant sections of the Constitution. We have highlighted five principal threats to cultural, religious and linguistic rights. Four out of these five relate to language rights. Dave, why are language rights a top concern for the Foundation? Well, Tyler, if you look at our constitution, language rights are dealt with in section six in the founding principles of the constitution. They were regarded as so important that they weren't even included primarily in the Bill of Rights. So they they are among the first provisions of the constitution and they're really important. The uh, the Pan-South African Languages Board, PANSAL, commented recently that, you know, they were not getting enough traction because uh, when people are hungry and when people are deprived, the last thing they're thinking of is language. But actually, that's wrong. Uh, the reality is that the languages we speak, the cultures we practice, the religions we follow are intricately involved in who we are, our personalities. And if these rights aren't protected, then other fundamental rights in the Constitution also fall by the way, such as human dignity. You can't have human dignity if people don't respect your culture and your language and your religion. You can't have equality if there's discrimination against you because of these things. And then quite a number of the human rights in the Bill of Rights depend on these rights, particularly language. That is why we regard them as important. And that is why the Foundation is publishing this annual report card on language, cultural and religious rights. Thank you, Dave. And it gives us a nice framework to work with as we discuss the findings of the report card. So let's dive deeper into the five principal threats. Ranking first in the list is the implementation of the Basic Education Laws Amendment Bill, or Bella Bill as it's more commonly known, which we believe poses a serious threat to the right to education in the language of choice, particularly for speakers of Afrikaans. Liam, you research section 29, subsection 2 and subsection 3 of the Constitution which deal with education in the official language of choice and the right to establish independent edu educational institutions. What were your findings? 100%. Well, so as you mentioned, Section 29.2 deals with education in the language of choice. Um, and we broke this up in the report into basic education um, language of choice as well as higher education language of choice. Um, if we look at um, Section 29.2, um, we found that currently a lot of the um, majority black population, when they go, uh, when there's um, schooling in the foundation phase, there is mother tongue <laughs> education, um, you know, based on whether it would be uh, the nine official languages of choice um, or the nine official languages besides English and Afrikaans. However, um, once the transition is moved away from foundation phase in from grade four in up to metric, um, there is uh, a transition into English and very little mother tongue education. One notable exception was found in the Eastern Cape where um, the, there's even been some June metric exams written in Isklosa and Sesotho, um, but that is um, not the rule for most of South Africa where um, English, um, where it is not the, the uh, home language of the, the people writing exams, that is the majority. <laughs> Um, uh, language of instruction. 
um, in the realm of um, Afrikaans medium institutions. We found that there's been um, a lot of uh, scrutiny on um, Afrikaans uh, primary schools and high schools regarding, um, you know, lots of calls that it is uh, another barrier of exclusion for people and language is being used as a proxy for race. Um, and in the Constitutional Court judgment of Hoer School Ermelo, um, the court found that in order to deprive someone of the ability to um, uh, that they are already enjoying of um, studying in the language of choice, um, there has to be appropriate justification from the, from, um, the state in that realm. So um, currently, um, with the uh, language policies in, in primary schools and high schools, um, that is primarily determined by the um, school governing body under the Schools Act. Um, but with a bill, um, this will give the ability um, to the MEC for education in a particular province to overrule um, and, and veto um, some aspects of the language policies. And so um, this this will come under um, a scrutiny, we believe, um, because <clears throat> this, this gives a lot more power to um, the provincial um, uh, department of education uh, rather than the SGB, which is currently um, the position under the current schools act. Um, in terms of the university level, um, the uh, uh, position of Afrikaans has obviously been a um, uh, ripe for lots of um, judgments, in especially the Constitutional Court. Um, in the University of Free State and Geleke Cancer Matters, um, there was um, a finding that the reduction of Afrikaans was justified um, in those circumstances, um, because in the in the um, case of uh, University of Free State, it was found to be um, the, the reduction of Afrikaans would lead to a more harmonious campus because now there isn't a, a segregation between Afrikaans speakers and um, non or people learning in um, English language, uh, English as a medium of instruction, um, and uh, the court found that this was um, an adequate and appropriate justification in line with the Wiskel Emlo case. Um, and in Geleke Cancer, the Stellenbosch um, rationale for reducing the um, position of Afrikaans as a language of instruction <laughs> was that it would um, unduly increase uh, tuition fees because of the um, you know material that had to be provided in, in two languages um, in the parallel medium um, realm. Um, these were both found to pass muster. And th these two judgments um, combined with the Department of Higher Education language policy um, that determined that Afrikaans is uh, excluded from the definition of indigenous languages seem to um, spell the, the death knell for Afrikaans in the um, in university um, language of instruction realm. However, we believe that this, this position was somewhat ameliorated by the UNISA judgment in 2021, where the Constitutional Court found that the reduction of um, Afrikaans as a medium of instruction in UNISA um, was done without appropriate justification. The, there was not um, appropriate um, cognizance given to the position of um, Afrikaans students that would be deprived of a right that they already <laughs> enjoyed. Um, and this was found to not be in line with Section 29.2. And um, Justice Majid in his judgment was quite strong that Afrikaans is not only the language supposed to be seen as the language of oppression, but rather a, um, a sort of cultural treasure that was um, formed out of a mul melting pot of different um, cultures. And then under the 29.3, um, uh, as I finish off, the um, in establishment of independent institutions um, has been widely practiced um, since um, the inception of the constitution, there are many religious um, uh, and private schools and uh, tertiary institutions. Um, we did find that with um, the introduction of the billable, there are a bit more um, uh, provisions regarding the um, regulation of homeschool education. So that has obviously increased since the um, uh, onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some homeschools report a 10,000% increase um, in, in intake in the last uh, five years or so. Um, and the billable uh, obviously tries to address some of the um, concerns that some people have with homeschool education regarding the quality thereof and maintaining parity with um, the quality of uh, education in the public sector. Um, and so more power has been given to um, the MECs for education to be able to conduct um, inspections and assessments uh, of homeschools in, in this realm. And that, that is one of the more substantial um, uh, increases of um, regulation in, in the sector.
Thank you, Liam. So focusing still on Section 29 and the right to education in one's official language, you touch on a few important cases, such as that of Khaleka Kansa versus the chairperson of the Senate of Stellenbosch University in 2019, as well as the University of Free State, State versus Afri Forum 2017 case. Dave, what impact did these judgments have on the way language is perceived today? One of the one of the disturbing factors about the Free State judgment was the idea that emerged from, particularly from the, the judgment of uh, former Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng, that languages can be the bearer of historic guilt. He said in his judgment that uh, whether, uh, whether people liked it or not, Afrikaans had become a means for discrimination. And he also said that of people who speak Afrikaans had to reckon with the fact that it had been perceived to be the language of repression under apartheid and colonialism. And therefore, many other South Africans viewed Afrikaans with a great deal of, uh, well, with, with negative uh, overtones. Now, this is disturbing because this is the chief justice, as he then was. And, and what he's doing is he's denying the idea of, uh, of uh, parity of esteem, which is one of the principles in Section 6 of the Constitution, that all languages should be treated equitably and with equal esteem. And it also cr creates this crazy idea that a language can be the bearer of historic guilt. If that were the case, then everybody in Germany would have to stop speaking German. And uh, the Russians wouldn't be able to speak Russian because of what Stalin did. So it, it just doesn't make any sense. And uh, the other reason why it doesn't make sense is that Afrikaans has spoken. More people who speak Afrikaans are not white than are white and who were also victims of apartheid. So this for us was a matter of, of deep concern. And the Stellenbosch case, the uh, Haleka Kasa case, also raised serious concerns because the government looked at this whole question of language and higher education. It, uh, it proposed uh, through Jake's Herbel, the Herbel Commission, that South African universities should adopt indigenous languages and develop them. And the Carroll report said that Potch of Stroom, campus of Northwest University, and Stellenbosch should in particular be, be seen as the guardians of Afrikaans. Now, the situation has changed completely, and Afrikaans is now being really eroded out of existence at any of the universities in South Africa. And we think that this is not in accordance with the principles of the Constitution, with Section 29.2, and we don't think it is in accordance with the idea of a multicultural society, a multilingual society in which all languages and cultures should be treated with, uh, with in an equitable manner. Thank you, Dave. Now, Ismail, language rights weren't our only focus. You researched into Section 15 of the Constitution, which deals with the right to freedom of religion, belief, and opinion. You also researched section 30 and 31 of the constitution, which dealt with the right to use the language and participate in the culture of your choice and the rights of cultural, religious, and linguistic communities. What were some of your findings? Well, that's quite right, Tyler. Indeed, language rights were not our only focus. In our assessment of cultural, religious, and linguistic rights in South Africa, we also delve into sections 15, 30, and 31 of the Constitution, critically evaluating their status on our nation's diverse population. So, section 15, a pillar safeguarding freedom of religion, belief, and opinion, garnered in our scorecard a grade A rating, which indicates a high level of compliance and a positive state of affairs regarding our assessment of this particular South Africa's fundamental respect for religious freedoms, even though our nation is secular. The majority of South Africans identify with various religious backgrounds and various cultural beliefs. 
and the Constitution ensures their right to practice and express their beliefs. However, a cause for concern arises from potential conflicts with recent legislation. Particularly, we explore the potential implications of the hate speech bill and the general intelligent laws amendment bill, the GLAB bill on religious freedom. We've identified as being primary threats to cultural, religious, and linguistic rights, and for good reason. So let me just elaborate on that a bit more. Firstly, the hate speech bill. Hate speech bill was designed to combat hate speech in South Africa, and while on the surface, it does aim to curb harmful speech targeting individuals or groups based on various grounds, including religion, it introduces potential concerns for religious freedom. The bill does provide exemptions for what they call the interpretation and proselytizing or espousing of any religious conviction, tenant belief, teaching, doctrine, or writing. But this exemption hinges on not advocating hatred that incites harm based on specific grounds. So the fear within the religious communities is that the broad and somewhat ambiguous definition of hate speech in the bill could inadvertently stifle religious communication. Religious beliefs sometimes touch upon sensitive topics, and believers might express convictions that, while not necessarily intended to incite harm, could, by this legislation, be interpreted as such. This creates a precarious situation where individuals and religious communities might self-censor to avoid potential legal consequences, thus impinging on their freedom to express their faith openly. And secondly, I just want to talk about the General Intelligent Laws Amendment Bill, the GLAB Bill, which is another legislative measure that has raised concerns regarding its impact on religious freedom. This bill empowers security services to vet individuals seeking to establish and operate religious organizations and nonprofit organizations. Now, the assumption behind this provision is to identify potential national security threats or individuals acting on behalf of foreign governments. And while we can all agree that national security is undoubtedly vital, the worry lies in the potential overreach and abuse of power. Granting security services the authority to vet religious organizations raises concerns about privacy and the freedom of religious expression. Religious organizations fear potential profiling and bias, wherein certain beliefs or affiliations might trigger unwarranted scrutiny, hindering the fundamental right to practice one's religion without unnecessary government intrusion. So in essence, both bills, while aiming to address legitimate concerns, need careful drafting and consideration to to address that balance between curbing hate speech on the one hand and ensuring religious freedom and privacy on the other hand. Now, I ought to say that there have been some positive developments. For instance, the draft marriage bill represents a commendable stride in inclusivity and equal treatment aligning with Section 15.1 of the Constitution. This bill seeks to ensure that all marriages, irrespective of sexual orientation, religion, cultural beliefs, are treated with equality and dignity. So by acknowledging diverse marriage types, this legislation mirrors South Africa's commitment to inclusivity. But I, without taking too much time, I'd also like to just shift my attention to sections 30 and 31, which pertain to language and cultural rights. And in that, we've identified a significant concern reflected in our grade C minus rating, implying a lower level of compliance with this right and symbolizing that this right is currently under grave concern of further deteriorating. This rating points towards a worrying trend, particularly affecting, alluding to what Dave said, English and Afrikaans speaking minorities in South Africa. So one principal threat to these cultural identities is the ongoing discourse surrounding the legacy of colonialism and its perceived connection to these cultures' historical role in oppression. So we've researched initiatives like the Roads Must Fall movement, which have brought these discussions to the forefront resulting in a heightened scrutiny of the place of English and Afrikaans in contemporary South Africa. Recent developments threatening Section 30 and 31, which pertain to language and cultural rights, are notably also highlighted in the case of the city of Tuana Metropolitan Municipality versus Afriforum. This judgment, this judgment has significant implications for the rights of linguistic and cultural communities. Now, Judges Cameron and Judges Froneman emphasized a potential implication. Any reliance by white Afrikaner individuals 
on cultural traditions rooted in history finds no recognition in the Constitution linking it to a history rooted in oppression. Judge Jafta further noted that the transformative Constitution before us does not recognize cultural traditions rooted in a racist past. He emphasized that racist and oppressive cultural traditions have no place in our constitutional order. And this is significant because it suggests a shift towards challenging historical traditions and potentially leading to their diminished acknowledgement or relevance in our modern South Africa. And uh, lastly on that, I can just say that the overarching concern here is that these dynamics may jeopardize the fundamental right to preserve and celebrate one's culture, which is protected by the constitution. The pushback against these cultures raises concerns about inclusivity and diversity and vision by the constitution. Uh, our, our research then also led us to an incident at uh, Stellenbosch University on the 14th of February, 2023, a very recent development where a complaint was lodged by the AfriForum youth. They allege that Afrikaans speaking students who identify strongly with their language and their culture were explicitly instructed not to speak Afrikaans in any context or on campus. This directive included private and informal engagement on their language rights as outlined in the constitution. The magnitude of this issue is significant. Stellenbosch University has a substantial amount of Afrikaans speaking students in its student body. The restrictions placed on Afrikaans in social and private gatherings cause fear and distress among Afrikaans speaking students, making them hesitant to use their mother tongue. And this not only implies their right to language, not only impacts their right to language, but also their ability to connect with their cultural identity. So while Section 30 and 31 pertaining to language and cultural rights have faced pressing issues, there are some glimmers of hope amidst the concerns. The recent recognition of the South African Sign Language as the 12th official language of South Africa still stands as a beacon of progress and positive development in promoting linguistic diversity in South Africa. Thank you, Ismail. And as you've said, ranking fourth in our principal threats list is the rights to freedom of religion and to form, join and maintain cultural, religious, linguistic and civil society organizations due to the impact of these four alarming laws that we believe might impact freedom of expression and open the way to intrusive state interference in and control over their legitimate activities. Dave, in our report, we also point to the state's failure to promote indigenous languages, which has resulted in not all official languages being treated equally. In fact, despite South Africa's now 12 official languages, English has increasingly become the single de facto official language of South Africa. Of course, globally, English does dominate, but what more should the state be doing to, to promote other languages in our country? Well, in fact, Tyler, this again was so important that it was the second item in section six of the constitution, a foundational uh, section of the, of the constitution, even surpassing the Bill of Rights, which asked, in fact, ordered the state to take action to develop South Africa's indigenous languages. And unfortunately, this hasn't happened. And there are a number of reasons why it hasn't, hasn't happened, but it has very negative impacts. First of all, South Africa, the Rainbow Nation, uh, really represents an enormously rich heritage uh, derived from the different communities, languages, and cultures which make up the identities and languages of each of these communities is very important to them. These are the languages people speak at home. Only 9% or so of South Africans speak English at home. They're also the languages that people should have as the basis for their primary school education. It has been found time and time again that unless kids are taught in a language they understand during the foundational phase of education, that they find it very difficult to make progress when they go into high school. Even, even if they are learning English at the primary school level, it's found 
that if they're also having the other subjects and the language they best understand, they do much better when they get to high school and university. The fact that so many kids uh, who don't have English as their first language end up having to write matric in English is a huge disadvantage. One of the positive developments is that the Department of Basic Education has been introducing an introduction to African languages initiative in a number of schools where they're taking uh, the domestic, the indigenous languages beyond the first three, level, three years into the foundational phase of primary school. And the interesting thing is that the kids that go through this program do much better than those who are taught in a language they don't really understand. And that shouldn't be a surprise. So the development of indigenous language isn't just a nice thing to have. It is in fact essential for the citizens who speak indigenous languages to be able to enjoy the full spectrum of their rights. If people are not served by government in languages they understand. It means that their rights to a whole spectrum of uh, qualities and rights in the Bill of Rights is diluted. You need to be sure that when you go to a magistrate, when you go into the courts, that you will be treated, you will be able to communicate your views in the best possible manner you can. And that is just not happening. And we must remember that quite a high percentage of our total population, maybe 30 to 40% of Black South Africans don't have a really great grasp of English and maybe 25, 30% of colored South Africans. So it is basically unfair to think that they cannot interact with government and particularly with the courts in the languages that they best understand. There are a whole lot of reasons why, why we haven't been able to make more progress with indigenous languages. To start with, uh, for many of the school governing bodies in, in uh, schools where there's a black majority, the language of aspiration is English. So they want to, switch to English as quickly as possible. And then there aren't enough teachers who are trained to teach in indigenous languages. There are not enough textbooks and there's not enough, the state isn't making sufficient resources available. But this for us is one of the greatest failings of our new society in terms of what we set out to do in the constitution uh, when it was adopted in 1996. Thank you, Dave. But it isn't only the state that is responsible for promoting Indigenous languages. In our report, we also looked at key state institutions. Liam and Ismail, part of the report, looked at institutions such as the Commission for the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Cultural, Religious and Linguistic Communities, also known as the CRL Commission, and the Pan-South African Languages Board. Liam, what were your findings on the CRL Commission? Yes, as you, as you mentioned, um, the CRL Commission is um, supposed to promote respect for um, cultural, uh, religious and linguistic communities and promote and develop um, peace, friendship and humanity among um, these, these particular communities. And so um, they are a Chapter 9 institution created in Section 185 um, for these uh, purposes. Um, we found that they, although the commission has been active in commenting on bills that have a, a certain religious tinge to it, um, and they do a lot of community engagements, uh, um, and uh, one of the uh, symptoms for this is that other Chapter 9 institutions um, and, and other uh, statutory institutions have had to take over a lot of, of their mandate. Um, it, the um, uh, matter in Stellenbosch was mentioned earlier about uh, students who weren't, who weren't able to speak uh, um, in Afrikaans, um, the this you would think would be in the wheelhouse of the CRL Commission, but yet this uh, matter was reported to the Human Rights Commission and has and um, many linguistic and religious matters have been taken over by the Human Rights Commission. Um, and it is for this reason, as well as the um, uh, Commission for Gender Equalities, a lot of um, 
That chapter nine institutions work has also been taken over by the Human Rights Commission. Um, there has been um, a push um, and um, lately in the Constitutional Review, Review Committee um, of Parliament, um, there's been a push for a, a unification of the um, Commission for Gender Equality, the CRL Commission, and um, a bunch of um, statutory institutions to um, make one general human rights body um, as a Chapter 9 institution. And this would obviously require a constitutional amendment um, so that these um, uh, there wouldn't be a... Um, sort of division of resources, um, there would be one human rights body that handles all of these matters, as the Human Rights Commission de facto is currently um, doing at the moment. Um, the, the CRL Commission uh, has, um, in the 2022 year, according to the annual report, dealt with about 68 complaints um, in 2022, and most of which um, were internal church squabbles and um, relatively minor matters um, that were dealt with expeditiously. Um, one of the larger reports that they had to do um, uh, had to do with a uh, allegations um, from uh, about 2020 after a News 24 report on uh, the Kwasi Zabantu um, mission in Kozlo Natal. <clears throat> uh, there were allegations that this uh, mission um, was acting uh, in sort of cult a cultish manner, where there were ma um, massive allegations of assault and, and sexual assault. And so um, there were hearings um, that were held um, and the commission uh, came up with a report in um, uh, 2023 um, where it found that the um, the leaders of the church um, had to apologize or other the leaders of the mission had to apologize for um, what would happen to some of the, um, the members of the church. But um, none of what they found was um, in violation of the right to freedom of religion. And um, they encourage victims to report to the police um, any, any any of the crimes committed. Now, um, this is uh, wholly unsatisfactory for if you found that there is a, um, you know, th there was potential for massive human rights violations, um, it, it doesn't seem that you, you can in the same breath say that there was also, um, you know, compliance with uh, freedom of religion as well. Um, so a lot of a lot of what they what they do um, is is um, relatively minor. Um, and in terms of such an important report, you would think that they would um, have a remedial action which de deals with the, the, the gravity of, of the allegations. Yeah. Um, so we did find that um, the move to uh, a concerted human rights body um, with amalgamating a lot of these chapter nine institutions and statutory bodies um, would provide for a, a, a bit more robust protection of cultural, uh, religious and linguistic rights. Thank you, Liam. So the other body that we looked into was the Pan-South African Languages Board. Dave, what were the findings on this body? And do you agree with Liam's assertion that a single comprehensive human rights commission is the answer? Well, uh, the reality is that, that, that Pan-South hasn't achieved the goals for which it was established. It was meant to be the champion of South Africa's multilingual communities. It was meant to ensure that government would carry out the, the requirements in section six, the requirements in the use of official languages act, but it hasn't. It was meant to, to promote the development of indigenous languages, but this hasn't really happened. Uh, there were many problems, uh, governance problems in Pansalb in the past. I think the new organization, the latest board, is doing its best to try to, to carry out its mandate, but it doesn't have the resources and it doesn't have the support of the government that it needs in order to carry out its functions, particularly with regard to monitoring and uh, uh, implementing the Use of Official Languages Act. So sadly, it hasn't achieved its objectives. As to whether it should be subsumed in a giant umbrella human rights organization, that's another question. I'm a little bit worried that this, that if this were to happen, the very important area of language rights might become diluted in such an organization. My view is that the problem doesn't lie with the fact that we have a separate pansal. The problem lies with the fact that 
Pansalb hasn't been given the necessary support and resources by the government. Ismail, do you agree with that, that it's not a fact that the commission needs to be absorbed into one single body with South African Human Rights Commission, PANSELB, CRL Commission, but that there needs to be more allocation of resources from the state to enable the institution to do its work? Well, Tyler, I think it's a little bit of both. I, I do agree with uh, Liam in that the amalgamation of PANSELB into other organizations would necessarily then mean more government resources into that single unified organization. And I think PanSelf's performance speaks for itself. We've given PanSelf a rating of a D plus, which is very poor indeed. And this is primarily due to its struggles in effectively fulfilling its mandate and achieving its objectives. And the key reasons for this encompass, well, resource constraints. The organization faces challenges due to insufficient funding, support from the government, but this inadequacy hampers PANSELB's efforts to promote and develop all official languages and other languages in South Africa. So additionally, our report underscores ineffective language development, particularly in the realm of indigenous languages, attributing the lack of progress to limited resources. Now, monitoring challenges has also been a challenge of PANSELB. Monitoring challenges have emerged as another significant issue. PANSELB has failed to effectively oversee the implementation of the Use of Official Languages Act, mainly due to non-submissions of language policies and practices by government departments. Furthermore, failures in legislative compliance have arisen, manifesting as government departments neglect to submit their mandated annual reports to PANSELB, revealing a lack of compliance and cooperation all across the board. So the ASMAL report, which is officially titled Report of the Ad Hoc Committee on the Review of Chapter 9 and Associated Institutions, therefore represents a critical document that analyzed and has advocated for reforms to Chapter 9 institutions in South Africa. It made a pivotal recommendation within this report, and that was the establishment of that single comprehensive human rights commission, which the objective was to consolidate all those several existing Chapter 9 institutions, the South African Human Rights Commission, the Commission for Gender Equality, the CRL Commission, uh, PANSEL, the National Youth Development Agency, and thus to streamline and enhance the protection and promotion of human rights across diverse domains. So there are benefits to this, I should say. The potential benefits uh, encompassed increased efficiency and coordination, uh, just as I spoke about. And this would be achieved through a streamlined effort, which would reduce duplication across the board and would foster a more comprehensive approach to addressing a wide array of human rights, including linguistic, cultural, gender-related, youth, and general human rights issues. Integral to this proposal was the incorporation of PANSELP into that unified body, applying the integration of language rights and issues previously managed by PANSELP into this broader framework. I think this gives us a sense of the importance of language rights. Uh, the proposal was, as Liam mentioned, presented to Parliament's Constitutional Review Committee. If approved, it would, I think, hold significant implications for the protection and advancement of South Africa's languages and other human rights. What struck me, though, when reading our report and when perusing through our research was the comment by Pansel in its 2020 one 2022 annual report regarding the competition between language rights and socioeconomic rights. The comment being that language rights compete with socioeconomic rights violations where ordinary people should, quote unquote, rather complain about obvious poverty, service delivery, and unemployment issues, and went on then to state that language rights and the right to a language are somewhat inconsequential to a hungry stomach. This assertion that language rights may be perceived as inconsequential when compared to immediate socioeconomic challenges like poverty and service delivery and unemployment, I think underscores the difficult balance our nation faces. This comment implies that when faced with pressing concerns such as poverty and unemployment, individuals may prioritize these socioeconomic rights over their language rights. This competition for attention this competition for resources can potentially marginalize language rights in the broader socioeconomic landscape. 
So within the CRL Commission's scope, the prioritization of socioeconomic rights could, could inadvertently undermine the cultural and linguistic rights of various communities. Cultural and linguistic aspects are integral to the work of the CRL Commission, and lack of emphasis on these rights could impact the protection of diverse cultural and linguistic communities, especially minority communities. The CRL Commission tasked with promoting and protecting cultural and linguistic rights may face challenges in garnering adequate policy attention and resources if language rights are seen as secondary to socioeconomic concerns. And while addressing socioeconomic challenges is, we must admit, undeniably crucial, it is also essential to advocate for a balanced perspective that acknowledges the significance of both socioeconomic rights as well as cultural and linguistic rights. Thank you, Ismail. And Dave, I'm just going to close with you speaking to um, the point that Ismail just made. You touched on it in the beginning. How are South Africans meant to mirror or deal with the fact that language rights do compete with socioeconomic rights? In our human rights report card for 2022, the top principal threat to human rights was the unsustainable conditions of socioeconomic rights violations. So the comment of language rights are inconsequential to hungry stomach. How do we respond to this as South Africans? Well, I don't think that they're in competition. Uh, language rights are not in competition with, uh, with the need to address the poverty and inequality and lack of social development in our country. In fact, if people have the ability to enjoy their language rights as they're supposed to, it would enhance the process of addressing the other problems, particularly education. So we shouldn't underestimate the importance of language rights and cultural rights and religious rights in an, in an intensely diverse society such as ours. Our type of society requires respect for all of the different communities that make up the Rainbow Nation, the language communities, the religious communities, the cultural communities. And these things are very important. Although it is correctly observed that people think first of all about poverty and language, and poverty and, and economic problems, et cetera, et cetera. History is full of situations where people actually concentrate on their religious rights. They're prepared to sacrifice anything in the name of their religion, where they they prepared to sacrifice anything for their language or their culture. And we must look at the reality now that nearly all of the conflicts in the world since the beginning of the new millennium have centered on inter-community struggles within countries, between religious groups, between language groups, between cultural groups. And that is why it's so important in a diverse society like ours to ensure that all of these different communities feel wanted, included, and secure. And that is why we are publishing this, uh, this human rights, this uh, CRL, this cultural religious and linguistic rights report card so that we can keep this very important dimension of uh, South African political life under the attention of decision makers and South Africans, because it is important. It's not that this by any means derogates from the need to address the pressing uh, problems that that we encounter throughout our society with poverty, inequality, unemployment. But it's part of the general mix that makes up the total situation that we South Africans must address.
Well, thank you, Dave, Ismail, and Liam for joining me today. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this episode of the Constitution at Work. The Foundation's 2023 Cultural, Religious, and Linguistic Rights Report Card will be released this Friday, the 22nd of September, in honor, in honor of Heritage Day celebrated on the 24th. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at FW De Clark Foundation to get your copy and keep up with our latest news. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on post notifications to be alerted when our next video is up. If you have any feedback on today's episode, please feel free to have your say in the comments section.